Hello and welcome to The Gist. I'm your host, Chris Vetrano, here every week to break down all the things that are happening in pop culture and interviewing the people that make it pop. Today, I've got a pop culture OG joining the podcast. He was a top 10 finalist on the very first season of American Idol, who went on to release multiple albums of sultry dance music that can be heard in clubs around the world. And he starred in the hilarious Eating Out film franchise. Now, after a 12-year hiatus from music, he's back with a hot new single. Take a Bow is available everywhere you listen to music now. And that can only mean that my guest today is the one, the only, Jim Vararos. Hi, hey, Chris. Jim. How are you? Thanks for having me. Of course. I am so excited to have you because... You, I mean, people that listen to the podcast, they know I'm an American Idol fan, Kelly Clarkson stan. Same. Um, I was, I, I can't remember, I was, I was, I think like it was my junior, sophomore, junior year of high school when American Idol came out and yeah. I became obsessed with mm-hmm. it. Um, and you were such a big part of it. I had uh, your TV guide. Uh, where you were on the cover. Um, So, you know, very excited to have you and talk to you about it today. I know you've got your new single, but before we get there, I want to take it back 21 years, which is when um, we first got introduced to you on Idol. Tell me how that kind of came to be for you. Uh, It was so, you know, spur of the moment. I had a good friend of mine um, who had called me on the phone. She said, I'm driving in my car. I'm hearing this commercial for this show. And you could win a record deal. And I was like, okay, I mean, that sounds fun. You know, and I was, I was at Columbia College um, in Chicago um, just studying, you know, musical theater and vocal performance. So I wasn't really like headed down the pop star route. I really loved theater um, mm-hmm. and, you know, being on stage was, was really sort of my, um, my first love. So um, I, I went, it was, um, uh, it was at the Congress Plaza Hotel and I walked in and there was nobody there. And so I'm looking for someone um, to audition for and someone with a head mic kind of walked up and she was like, oh, just have a seat. We're just waiting for more <laughs> people to show up. Uh, and I was like, OK. Um, oh, wow. So, again, this was like before there are like stadiums now of like people auditioning. You have to go through like 19 rounds just to like see a human being. Um, but uh, so I waited until three or four more people kind of showed up and then they took us in this tiny little banquet room uh, with a you know, old school camcorder that looked like you could be doing softcore porn in the room. Um, so I thought, what am I getting myself into? Um, and then you stepped up to this line, which is just duct tape on the floor. And they had you sing, you know, a couple of bars of whatever you wanted. I think I sang um, like a jazzier like song, just because I didn't want to do something super pop and super mm-hmm. common. I just wanted to be a little, just a little different. And they're like, great, can you sing something pop? And I was like, great, sure. Um, <laughs> And then they bring you out and, you know, someone tries to like pull some, you know, kind of information about you and your life. And, you know, I told them my parents were deaf and mm-hmm. they took that and that was ran with it. Yeah. That was my story, you know, and, and I think looking back, it was it served a purpose. And I think, um, you know, it allowed, I think, America to sort of connect with me on, on that in that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just didn't want it to be all about, you know, because that's just my family. That's my family. That's my life. That's nothing, you know, new to me. Right. And then after that, you did the audition in front of the actual judges where right. you actually like signed the... Well, Paula asked me to. And I was oh, like, okay. what am I going to say? No. So I was just not <laughs> prepared. I didn't like fully flesh out, you know, the audition <laughs> to be America's next sign language interpreter. I just was not prepared for that. So it was a little sloppy, honestly. But, you know, I think it, I think it did the, it did the job for the yeah. time, you know. Yeah. Well, and it, like you said, it gave you kind of like your story arc. It gave you something that set you apart. And I think that was, that ended up working in your favor because, you know, that was at the time, no one really knew what it was. Right. And you got to be, have something that people could remember you for, which is always good. Totally. And you can't control, you know, what's on the cutting room floor. And, you know, all you can do is portray your best self and, you know, hope for the best. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, being in like musical theater and all of that at the time, you weren't familiar with Pop Idol or the show in the UK and and like didn't know that that's kind of what they were trying here. Not until I, you know, sort of auditioned, was I like, where did this come from? And then I started to look at like Will Young and looked up his auditions and I was like, who's Simon Cowell, this really mean British guy, like why, <laughs> you know? And, um, but then for me, it was Paula Abdul, that was the cell. I was like, yeah. oh my God, I love her. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and to have the chance just to meet her. I think I was more excited about just like meeting her than like our <laughs> show. Yeah. Um, and she's everything that you could ever want and hope her to be like, she's like even better than that. Um, so that was really exciting. That was the sell. And then I ended up, you know, going to Hollywood, which is really yeah. Pasadena, um, <laughs> which is kind of a letdown. Um, but, you know, again, like I, I want to stress that, the landscape of season one was just so different. I think that mm-hmm. they were trying to figure things out as as we went. You know, rules were changed. I think that, you know, they were just like, how do we make this work? And, you know, I think being a part of that very first season is very different than, you know, seasons after because you didn't expect anything. There was, yeah. there was no, you know, expectation of a tour, an album, merch, right? Like you didn't really know what was going to happen. And so right. once we made top 10, I think, you were sort of like a part of all these great opportunities. And, you know, it was like a Ford Focus commercial. Great. You, know? <laughs> and you and, just ran with it, you know? Yeah. And like the tour and stuff like that, that wasn't initially part of the contract, right? Because they didn't no. know that it was going to become this like major, huge pop culture moment. I mean, that was huge. I was like, we're going on tour. Like that was just a yeah. total, you know, surprise. And also probably the best part of, I think, the entire experience. There's no judges, you know, and these people who have sort of grown with you throughout the last couple of months of the show, you're sort of like given this fan base. And Mm -hmm. in any other, you know, platform, it takes years to build that. And so that was what I was most grateful for is that, you know, you're, as an artist, you know, you're doing something different every week, right? So it's Motown or pop or rock, right? And so you're trying to do these different genres of music, also trying to figure out your identity as an artist and where you fit in, you know, to, to music, but you get on tour and these people have connected with you. They're invested in you. They want to know what's coming. And so it's an incredible chance to, you know, put out music as quick as you can to feed, you know, that, that hunger for it. Yeah. And I mean, talking about how it became such a kind of pop culture phenomenon. You guys went on tour together, but also, and as we said, the show has changed so much and evolved so much, but in that first and second season, you guys also had the, uh, the house that you guys stayed in. (laughs) And, um, and so you guys actually kind of got to know each other, I think better than you don't see the camaraderie as much on the like more recent seasons. And I don't watch like anymore, but I mean, even in the later seasons of idol, you didn't feel this kind of camaraderie the way that you guys did. I mean, you guys were so sad when people were voted off and there was just like, you could tell there were like friendships that were really formed in that experience. It's so true. And it's funny that you mentioned the house only because I think that they introduced that to make it almost be like, could this also be like the real world as well? Mm -hmm. You know? And um, I don't think it really like played out that way, but you know, it was a cool opportunity. And I think that the biggest thing for all of us is that I don't really remember any of us being like super competitive with each other. I think it was Mm -hmm. very just like, I'm just going to do the best I can for myself. It wasn't like, Oh, I need to like, you know, beat Kelly or beat Tamara. It was never like that. It was just very like whoever wins wins and we're happy for whoever. And, you know, that's how at least I felt the whole time. But again, I, this wasn't sort of my dream. It wasn't, Mm -hmm. I was trying to be a pop star. You know, I just wanted to be an actor really more than anything after that. So it was a really kind, supportive, you know, we were just rooting for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, it felt, and it felt that way. I mean, it yeah. felt really authentic in that kind of way. And uh, I know that you on social and stuff, you're you're keeping up with some of the folks still from that yeah. season. Yeah. Do you? I mean, do you feel like you still have some of those like friendships that yeah, you created sure. there? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Christina, she came to my wedding. Um, you know, in 2021, she actually referred me to my corporate job that I have now. Um, so she's, she and I've been close for like the last 20, probably 20 plus years. Wow. Um, with Kelly, it's been a couple of years since I've seen her in person, but my husband, Sean and I went to see her Vegas residency, um, end of, um, uh, July. So, mm-hmm. um, I haven't seen her in a couple of years. Um, I had sent her some footage for her talk show, um, sort of like as a, where are they now update? It was like me, Tamira and Christina. Um, but Ryan Starr and I, you know, we, we still talk, um, RJ and I still talk, EJ and I still talk. We're very close. I don't, yeah. um, I like to just keep that tight and it takes work. You know, I think I organized during the pandemic, a little reunion like via zoom and I pretty much got everyone except Kelly, uh, and Nikki. And then Justin, after that on his podcast ended up getting like the nine of us together too. So, 
Amazing. Uh, yeah, it's fun. They're all incredible people. And, you know, to have a career 20 years, you know, after, you know, like Justin doing this incredible Broadway show and obviously Kelly's success is like monumental. Mm-hmm. It's a huge, it's a huge deal. If you can pay the bills, you know, yeah. and, and have a, have a career in it 20 years later. I mean, that's saying something. So, yeah. And you know, it is, it's so, you guys were all so memorable. I mean, everyone that, like I said, you were on the TV guide yeah. and, uh, you know, it was, it was such a pop culture phenomenon. And now, you know, I, I mentioned this, uh, I think Kimberly Locke was on the show and, um, I was mentioning to her, like Kelly Clarkson was on, uh, watch what happens live. And Andy Cohen had asked like, can you name a recent idol winner? And she was, she couldn't. Right. And it's like, but back in the day, like we knew all 10 of you, like we knew all of you, we were invested. I mean, I went to the tour. Uh, I had uh, the, the did you like it? I did. It was so funny. You know, I decked out in idol gear and, (laughs) and things. I was like, you know, very, very much a stand for it all. And, um, I even bought uh, a bootleg DVD of like somebody like recorded the tour and I like bought the DVD because I like wanted to watch it again. I love that. I don't even (laughs) have a a copy of that DVD. I would totally want that actually. It's, um, I'll have to see if I still have it. I, I mean, it's not good. It's not good quality. I mean, I bought it on eBay probably for like way too much money Amazing. and they like said it was professionally filmed. And then of, of course, course I got it. Yeah. And it was like somebody on their camera phone. Breathing which... heavy and like shaking the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but it was, I mean, it was so different. And now it's like, you know, the shows really are focused on the judges yeah. and the coaches or whatever format the show is. And that's really more of what is like the ratings appeal. And it's right. less about the talent. And yeah. you guys at the time, it was like, we were, you guys were actually pushing out real like talented people that could have careers from it. And I mean, we saw that with so many of the contestants and then you uh, released your debut album, Roller yeah. Coaster. Mm-hmm. Um, so you said I wasn't interested in really becoming a pop star, yeah. but then Roller Coaster happened. And I mean, you were a pop star. I mean, not, I mean, I wouldn't go that far, but I, <laughs> I had this, someone reached out to me, you know, after the show. And I think for, in my personal experience, you know, I think going through that process, and being, you know, openly gay with people on the show, I just, I didn't really say anything publicly just because I, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't really think about it until, yeah. you know, both out and the advocate while I was on tour wanted the exclusive uh, to my story. So um, I think I just kind of took a beating, you know, I think publicly just from, you know, I, I just wasn't as good, you know, in terms of vocals, like, in you know, in terms of like just comparatively speaking to everyone else. And I, I knew that, like, I'm not stupid, um, but I just th- thought, I think I just sort of listened to that. And I was just like, you know what? You're not a singer. You're, you know, you're an actor. So, you know, go that route. And then I got this email from uh, Gabe Lopez, who produced I mean, my first two, my first two records. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know who he was. And, you know, he had sent me a few songs that he had produced and worked on. I thought, oh, these sound really good. And he was like, I want to work with you. Like, I think you have a really nice tone and I think we could, you know, build something. And I, thought, okay, you know, I'm, I'm open to someone that believes in me. Right. And he, he was responsible for everything. You know, he was like, I remember I was like, yeah, I really think I should do like a John Mayer vibe. He's like, "Mm, no, (laughs) we're not doing a John Mayer vibe. And I was like, okay. Um, And then he really pulled out, you know, things that I didn't think I had. And, you know, it's different when you're outside of like a television show where people are watching you. And remember this was before social media. We had no Mm -hmm. social media back then. We had message boards literally. Right. Um, and handwritten mail um, that I got. So, you know, I was bullied for sure. You know, I was, you know, I had gotten horrible, you know, messages like a faggot will never win American Idol. And, you know, it it was pretty scathing. And I was like, you don't even know me. Like you don't even, we've never even met. Like, and I feel like if you knew me, you would actually like me, you know? But again, it's like when you put yourself out there, that's what you're subjected to. Um, And that wasn't really represented on TV at the time either. I mean, there were like few things here and there, like Queer as Folk, I think probably was on yeah. and, and uh, Will and Grace and things like that. But like- But from a music it, point of view, yeah, there was no male pop American out anything, anything, yeah. zero. So, you know, no one gives you, I didn't have agents or managers after Idol shaping my career after someone because there was no someone else. You know, like Troy Sivan, who is amazing, love mm-hmm. him. He came out 10 years after on the scene that I came out. So mm. just to put things into perspective, you know, shows like 
you know, glamorous on Netflix with Kim Cattrall and, you know, even shows like The Idol with Troy Sivan, who, who, who acted in that show too. Right. Um, the popularity of Schitt's Creek and all of those things and, you know, Vincent and some other idols that are doing really well, David Archuleta, you know, um, Adam Lambert, um, David Hernandez, Michaela Gordon, all these great talents from Idol, you know, it was a different time. So I just feel like in a lot of ways, and I've, I've said this in a couple of interviews, if I just, if my career had just shifted like five, 10 years later, I would have had a better shot, I think, or at least have had people in my corner say, okay, we know what to do with you. You know, here's what we're going to model you after. Um, and, and the eating out movies, right. That came out in the early two thousands, you know, they're, they're not like, you know, Oscar worthy, obviously, but they don't have to be, you know, they're, they're moments of representation, which we just didn't have. And so, yeah. yes, they were quirky and fun and campy and, you know, and, and I loved being a part of that because in a way I almost was looking at myself years before not having that. And I thought, well, this is going to do something for, for, for queer youth, you know, before me. So, yeah. you know, I just think it's defining success differently, you know, as yeah. it works for you, you know? Yeah. I mean, and you know, it's interesting. I do want to like touch on that yeah. kind of coming out story because obviously publicly you came out during the tour, yeah. but were you out during the show? Yeah. And so the con other contestants, they knew oh, yeah. your families knew it, there was no closeted gym at that point. No. Well, so I came out, um, before idol, I came out at 18 to my mother uh, and my sister, my sister's two years younger than me. Um, and I just had my mom wait until I told my dad, my dad and I had a very different relationship. You know, he's, he was born in Greece, hard of hearing, came to the U S when he was three, he was subjected to an immense amount of, abu of, of abuse growing up by his father, who also was abused by his father. It was just very generational. Mm -hmm. And I think when you are raised in that way, um, there is this ideal of this strong masculine Greek son who's going to carry on the tradition of the Veraros, you know, name. Mm -hmm. And I think as I got into my teens and I didn't really play sports, I was a gymnast, you know, I was in theater, you know, I just did different things. I think he knew I was different and I, I wasn't going to be that sort of idyllic, you know, vision of, of what his son was going to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we just didn't, we weren't very close. Um, he was very blue collar, worked all the time, was never really home, didn't take us on vacations. My mom was very much the both role for a long time until now. Now my dad and I are like inseparable, like we're very close. Um, but when you come from that world, it's hard to know. It's hard to understand what gay means, what it looks like, because right. he wasn't exposed to that growing up. So I had to almost teach him through two marriages. <laughs> I'm, you know, like, this is what a relationship looks like. It's actually very natural. It's very normal. You know, we cook dinner, we go to the movie, right? It's, it's just normal. And so I think once my dad saw that, I think he was more afraid of how mm -hmm. society would perceive me as being gay. Sure. Um, but I, I had my mom hold on to this for a year. I said, I'm not ready to tell dad yet. So once the advocate and out called me on tour, I had to tell my dad. So, okay. Cause I couldn't come out without, I didn't want my dad to like read about it, let alone right. like find out about it. So, right. you know, we were, it was the last um, stop on tour. We were in Seattle uh, and my parents flew out for it from Chicago. And, you know, I, we were, at, I was staying at the W and I was feeling very fancy. I was like, I'm going to buy them dinner. I'm going to like, you know, make them feel good. And then I'm going to break the ice to my dad. <laughs> and, you know, he reacted fine. You know, I think as, as well as, you know, to be expected, but then I moved to LA right after tour. Like I didn't even come home. So I didn't really deal with how he was dealing with it when I, mm -hmm. when I had gone. And so my sister, you know, she was like, you know, dad's not doing well, you know, and he does not understand. And so she really kind of absorbed a lot of that while I was in LA. So, mm -hmm. um, but he came around and he is the most supportive, um, loving, you know, I, we're just so much more close like now, I think than we've ever been, but it took a minute, you know? Yeah. Well, and per perhaps the show maybe helped sort of smooth some of that because you were saying you were getting this, like, I mean, I hate to call it fan mail cause it wasn't, it was, it was, you know, what is now Facebook and the trash right. and garbage that people can just say whatever they want. Yeah. And at the time they were writing handwritten letters and stuff. And I have to imagine that like, he probably saw some of that. He, there must've been some kind of 
I mean, and, and I can't remember, like I remember as a viewer and a closeted kid myself in high school who was bullied and yeah. felt like I can't be myself because if I show any part of me, totally, it will be ridiculed or, you know, or worse. And, you know, I saw you on national television and on, you know, the cover of magazines and things. And, and I remember feeling like, well, he's doing it. And mm-hmm. like, maybe there is a spot for me in the world that I Thank could like that. be I mean, that way. Um, but it, but it's interesting to like think back or, or find out later that you weren't really ever out at that point. I just knew, I guess, and instinctively. And I feel like maybe your dad or your parents like probably had some of that going on as well, where maybe they, they kind of knew, but once you said it, it maybe even gave him a little bit of relief knowing that like, this is what that different thing that I was experiencing or feeling was. Yeah, for sure. No, I think that's very true. And I think also they were also very excited that I was bringing such awareness to the deaf community as well. And I Mm -hmm. think I'll never forget when we toured, we performed um, in Chicago here at the Allstate arena which is a, like a more suburban venue. So United Center is downtown Chicago, kind of like where all the big ones go. But if you're like just a little bit smaller, you would come to um, uh, the other venue, uh, Allstate Arena. And I remember people like like literally like doing like, like the I love you, like in the crowd, like for me, because it was they knew it was my hometown. And mm-hmm. I think my parents like seeing this was just like, Jim showed like really brought a light to the deaf community because everyone kind of, thinks that the deaf community doesn't really have a relationship with music and that's not true. I think that they, yeah. they feel it in a different way because they have to through tempo, bass, mm-hmm. you know, beats, like that's how you can feel the music. And so I would, you know, tell people like my mom or my dad, you know, if I would send my dad songs or he'd listen to my album, he'd pull up the lyrics and like read it and like crank up the bass and just try and make out as much as he could. So it's just different. There's a relationship yeah. there. It's just, so I think my parents were also very happy that, you know, I was, you know, very open about, you know, my, my childhood growing up being fluent in sign and, you know, being their interpreter in a lot of challenging situations at a young age. So yeah. they also were very grateful too. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, uh, you mentioned that I, uh, recently just saw the movie Coda and I was yeah, late no. to the game on it, Love it. but it was like, I mean, I don't want to like tear up and cry right now, but like the scene where you're realizing that like they're sitting in the audience, the parents, and they like can't hear their daughter on the stage. Mm -hmm. And it was like, and then to hear the dad's like sort of interpretation of like, I want to feel it differently. Mm -hmm. So sing close to me and like do these things. And so it just brought that memory up when you were talking about that. Cause that's, you know, it's something that like, I have such a connection to music and I've been such a music fan my entire life. And it has shaped a lot of who I am. And I just, I can't imagine like having never heard it. And yeah. that's something that, you know, I just, people don't think of. And so you, you're right. You did touch people in a way in that, because I think that was people realizing like you're doing this amazing thing on stage and you've got parents in the crowd who can't well, hear never, yeah. your voice. Yeah. Which is also good. Cause then my mom thinks I'm as good as Mariah. So I'm like, well, maybe that's a good thing, you know? <laughs> um, but I, I think like for, for me gr- just growing up as a kid, like I was, I would sing along with like everything and I would try to harmonize with like everyone on the radio. Right. And my mom would just look at me while she was driving and she'd keep like putting her, like her hand mm-hmm. on my throat, you know, or I would be performing in, in high school and we'd have an interpreter for my mom, um, you know, in, on the, in the mm-hmm. crowd and the, in the audience. And, people would like leave and they would go up to her and they'd be like, your son was just amazing. And mom's like, really? And they, cause she doesn't, I mean, how do you know, you know, but she kept getting these compliments, you know, from my performances. And my mom was like, all right, like, I guess he's okay. You know? Yeah. So it's hard because your parents, if they know you've got a talent, particularly as it's musically related, how do you know to push that or encourage that or feed yeah. that? You know what I mean? So I was sort of like, guess I'm doing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's, I wonder too, if, because, you know, you have obviously recorded music, but you've said a couple of times, like, I really just wanted to be an actor. Do you feel like that played a part in that at all? Like, because my parents and the way that I grew up, they could never experience the music side of things. Like Mm -hmm. it's more accessible for them in a, in an acting sort of way. Do you feel like that draws you to that in any way? I don't think that there's there's a direct correlation, but I guess now that I think about it, you know, when an interpreter is is signing 
you know, to, um, to a deaf person and it's just in a conversation or it's just an exchange, you can look at someone's facial expressions and sort of at least get it from, from that perspective. But when you're singing, it's, it's a lot harder to communicate that. Um, I just feel like I'm just stronger in that, in that area. I, you know, when we shot eating out, you know, two movies, you know, we shot those in 10 days. I had maybe one or two takes, you know, for everything, just cause we were on a time frame and, right. you know, it was, a, it was just a low budget, you know, independent, you know, film. I, and I just felt very in my element. It felt very easy for me. I, I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed the process. I loved hearing the, the criticism and the direction and wanting to, okay, second take, I'll nail it. I just really felt at home and it mm-hmm. was very, I don't know. I just, I, I just loved it. And then my first stage production, I was seven and I did the music man at the local high school that I would have attended years later because my choir teacher at seven was like, you need to be on stage. And I was like, okay. You know, and I think be, there's a rush that you get from like a very raw element, like a Broadway stage or, you know, an off-Broadway stage. I mean, theater will give you that high because it's, it's immediate and it's, you know, you feel, you feed off of an audience, just like a performance, you know, too. So I think that was just what I, what I thought I should be doing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so let's talk a little bit about that. The, the eating out years, Um, obviously then you became kind of this like cultural out gay icon. um, And you were able to kind of really be the, I think I read like, there wasn't another out contestant on American Idol for like another three years or something like that after Mm -hmm. you. And I know since even some of your fellow uh, contestants have come out, Yeah, but it really was still very taboo and you became sort of the quote unquote poster child for the gay guy from American Idol. Yeah, And like, did that resonate to you and did that feel like you had kind of paved a path or was that something that you felt like you wanted to, strip away from the, that kind of title? I think I just sort of embraced it. I didn't really think, um, you know, when you're so young, Chris, it's like you just sort of have, you just like roll with it. You almost like don't think, you just do. And mm-hmm. I just, all I knew was is that I couldn't not be out publicly because I wasn't going to do this unless I was going to be true to myself. You know, you hear all these things about people like, you know, not being true to themselves and hiding and all of that. And I was like, well, I don't want to do that. I'm not, even though I was told, like so many times that I should shut my mouth because I wasn't going to have a career. And to some degree, that was probably partially right um, for the time. I mean, in the early 2000s, yeah, I think it was detrimental to my career that I, I came out publicly because I was so young. Um, you know, I, I was told to just be quiet about it, but I just couldn't do it. I just, yeah. I would just rather you know, I was thinking at myself at 16 or 15 and like who I would have needed to see. And, you know, that just like resonated with me. So, um, I, I felt like in terms of just being a poster boy or the poster child, I was just happy to just be open. I was just mm-hmm. happy to like, Hey, I can act and I can do these, I can do music now and, and go to the Abbey, you know, in LA mm-hmm. and like not worry about, you know, anything. And, you know, I, I hope that future idols, you know, saw that and maybe felt a little bit safer or a little bit more um, welcomed that, you know, Hey, I did it, you know, and you know, you're, you're going to be fine if you do too. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And I mean, and the world evolved a bit. I mean, now, yeah. as you mentioned, like Troy Savans and yeah. the Sam Smith's and there's, totally. there's all kind of Kim Petras and yes. all of these like icons now but like there, it was such a different time. And so we're really talking about that. And I think, you know, for people listening, I think like it, it, it might feel a little like, well, you know, what did Jim really do? And like, right. he was a poster child of something that like now isn't as taboo, but it was truly taboo then it really that was. like there wasn't people doing that. And I think, you know, um, did you know about, like the other contestants from your season? Did you also know were they out like in a, closed door setting and they chose not to be out publicly or were they still sort of closeted? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, you know, the story with RJ Helton, obviously from my season, just a tremendous talent. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, him and I very much bonded like throughout the entire, you know, first season, you know, him and I were, I mean, he wasn't, 
he wasn't out publicly. Um, he was also a Christian singer. And so right. he put out a Christian record. And, you know, I think that that is clearly, you know, going to be a hindrance um, right. in that world. Um, and so, you know, during our tour and all of that, like RJ and I were, you know, close. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I think when you go through something like that and you're young, that's going to happen. You know, you're going to find attraction. You're going to find someone that makes you feel like less alone, someone that you trust. And so obviously I was very attracted to RJ and it just sort of happened that we, you know, were just close. So right. I would never put that in danger. I never would have, you know, done anything to, you know, out him, out him, you know, uh, affect his career in any way or chances. Right. Um, but um, yes, he would be, he definitely would have been one of those people. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think, cause you know, I remember, I think it wasn't really until maybe kind of Adam Lambert yeah. that when his season, I mean, he was deemed sort of the wild idol. And yeah. I think that was like his Rolling Stone kind of, uh, cover. Yeah. And it was like, if he was wild. I mean, yes, he wore makeup and yes, he kind of like, and it's like, is that wild though? You know, right. it's like, like you mean the gay one is what you're yeah. trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. They were just trying to rebrand gay in yeah, a way. And totally. but and then I think from then on, it became more just sort of I'm gonna be who I am on the show. Totally. And when yeah. we started seeing a little bit more authenticity, but also I think that's when the show kind of stopped yeah. caring about the artists as much. That's and true. more on who was behind the judges' table. And you know, with him too. You know, he also had, I mean, the show had gotten even bigger by the time, you know, Adam Lambert was on. And so there were more eyes on him. I think that there was more pressure on him. And I was rooting for him. Like the, I was like, this, I'm like, this guy is insane. Like he needs to win. It's like stupid if he doesn't. So, you know, it was all, again, a different time, a different landscape. And I think we were a little bit further, you know, in the game, but I remember him doing that performance. I think it was, I can't remember if it was like the Billboard Awards or the VMAs mm -hmm. or something where he like made out with, yeah. you know, a guy. And I was just like, okay, like who cares? Like it just doesn't, and he got so much flack for it. Yeah. And I was like, do you not even hear him? Like his voice? Like how, I mean, this guy is so talented. He can do whatever the hell he wants as far as yeah. I'm concerned, you know, but um, I'm glad that he found the strength to kind of, I think, feel really comfortable in his skin eventually, just because I think it was proof positive that like people truly loved him and he had made such an impression on the world and it was also like, and I'm gay and right. it's not a big deal. You know, I just, yeah. I'm such a fan of his and I've never met him in person. I hope to, you know, sometime, but you know, he really was pretty incredible. Um, yeah. and I, I think we all needed him at that moment, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, and they, I mean, unfortunately that performance, I think they edited out the, the mm. kiss like on the later feed or something. Wow. And, you know, it was sort of this yeah. Janet Jackson, Super Bowl moment. Those are totally where, equivalent. Yeah. yeah. It just like everything like got yeah. blown out of proportion for something that today would probably not be, I mean, it isn't, I think no. we see it now in yeah. performances and, Definitely. you know, it's, it's very accepted. So it's again, like this evolution, but I think our American Idol has like really, um, kickstarted that in a lot yeah. of ways and, and the way that mu the music industry shifted. I even feel like at t I know that streaming and that yeah. uh, all of that has come, but there was really like a focus in the early part about like buy download the single and that counts as a vote. Like that started becoming a thing where it really sort of changed the music industry in that way where, I mean, even, you know, I remember um, my, one of my best friends, Cassidy Pope, who was on The Voice oh, yeah. and one, she, like, they would do the downloads and they would talk about how, like, her song went to number one and everyone was like, they saw the writing on the wall. Like, well, she's selling more singles than, like, the, some of the biggest people right now. So right. this is something, like, we need to invest in and we need to totally. keep going down this route. And I think at the time, you know, American Idol had kind of started that process. Yeah. Like, later on, they they figured out sort of this, like, vote through the phone and through like downloading because I'm sure, sure they got a kickback on all of that. I mean, they should really have artists who are in the top five start working on their albums then because it's right. a timing thing. Because if you don't like with Kelly, it was very fast. Like she had her debut single. The album was like a couple months later, the timing just worked. So like if you yeah. don't capitalize on all of that, especially when they're cranking out season after season after season, like the winner, I think for idol, you know, last year, 
there's no album out, you know, and I think right. if you're going to miss the mark and if you don't just run, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And even with Kelly, her album got delayed. Yeah. Um, and it didn't come out like before the next season and they ended up, I think like on the second season, Having she ended her up singing perform, I think. Yeah. anytime, but it wasn't even her single because they didn't know yet what right. they were doing. And she had, I think she changed some, um, I think some of the contracts and things behind the scenes were changing because again, the show didn't know what they had actually produced and they didn't know they had produced and given us a Kelly Clarkson. Literally. Yeah. I know you're a Kelly Clarkson Stan and I know that you've said in other interviews, you kind of felt early on in the American Idol journey that like Kelly might be our winner Yeah, and that you kind of saw that through. Was that the sense behind the scenes for everybody or was that just more like your intuition? I think from like the producer standpoint, they all were like, it's Justin. Because Kelly wasn't even on their radar until she was like ninth or eighth. I think once once they started to whittle down the 10, they were kind of like, oh, he's pretty good. You know, and I was yeah. just like, we're all idiots because like I've known this since Pasadena. Like yeah. we were, she was on the theater with me and like she was like five people down and I literally had to like look down and poke my head out. I'm like, who the fuck is this girl? I'm like, send me home. Like I'm done. I can't with this one. Like she was, I was obsessed with her. Yeah. Like, I'm like, this girl is it. Like, she's it. But I'm also very, very, like, a fan of that tone, that soulful, like, r and yeah. I love that. And she's classically trained, obviously. So I just loved her. I'm like, she had it all to me. I was like, this is it. We're done. Like, I can, you know, just send me home. Um, but people were like, I think it was either Justin or Tamira. And mm-hmm. I think people were very surprised that Tamira was fourth. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they, I think a lot of people thought it was going to be a Tamira Kelly kind of, um, finale. And then when it did come down to Justin, it was just like, well, Justin, you know, obviously had the sex appeal and like, you know, the female voters are going to, you know, vote like crazy. But then when you did the single, like before your love mm-hmm. or a moment like this, you're like, mm, I think it just f- fell more into Kelly's, you know, lane. Wow, so. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I wondered though, cause I feel like Kelly and I might be wrong on this, but, um, you know, I was a fan, like I said, so I feel I take pride in some of my facts, but <laughs> I feel as though Kelly never was in the bottom. Never, not once. And I, and I, so I always wondered if behind the scenes if producers were like, okay, she literally wins every week. And that was, and they just sort of, you know, we're not doing it in any kind of order. And like, so they just never really told you, but if producers were like, well, we know, cause I think Tamira's week, wasn't it? Tamira and Justin were the bottom two. So it was like pretty shocking. Yes, I think so. And so it was like, oh, well, both of them were front runners to win. Right. Yes. So w- someone crazy is going home tonight totally. and it ended up being Tamira. Right. Um, who I w- also just, as an aside, I never right. got the Tamira album that I was waiting for. Oh, you mean like the one that she didn't, the, the one after that she put out, you didn't like, you were like, eh, like not that one, you mean? Well, I felt like she, there was like a lot of talk that she was going to be, because I think, didn't they have the top five record albums or was it just the top three? No. So Justin had his album, Kelly, Nikki was signed, the project got dropped. So she never right. actually put out a full out record. Tamira put out an album. And then RJ signed with a Christian label. Christina was actually signed by 19 management. So she was in London, like working on her project. Um, Ryan Starr wasn't signed. AJ wasn't signed. EJ wasn't signed. And I didn't get signed until 2005. So um, yeah, that's kind of, I think, how it went down. Because I felt like there was, I felt like, and I, maybe I am wrong on this, but I felt like there was like a lot of sort of drama with the Tamira project. I felt like, we were hearing that she had signed and that she was going to release an album. And I, and I know that she was obviously on thankful right. with Kelly and, yeah. um, and I thought, okay, we're going to get something great. And then I felt like it just sort of fell apart. And then she sort of like re she did a new album that was like the second, her first, her debut album felt like it was her second album right. for some reason to me. But I, I always feel like there's a lost to my gray album that I wish I had. I mean, there probably is. I mean, I mean, there's, can you imagine like, again, this is the first season, all this stuff is riding on it. And like, you know, as a, as a young artist who has no true, you know, I mean, Tamara and Kelly, they, they were doing back, I think background vocals even before Idol. So they had a lot of experience in that, but right. you're fighting for artistry, your first album out, you know, mm-hmm. and you are listening to all these voices and, you know, your management and they're saying, well, you need to do this and you need to do that. And this is what sells. And, you know, so 
it's hard. Like I would just, I mean, even for, I was lucky with signing with like a small independent label, you know, uh, Koch records in New York. Mm-hmm. I was like, literally I gave them a finished album. Like it's done. You just need to put it out. And they were like, okay, great. And then it was done. So when you're on a major label, you know, I think that there are a lot of hands in the cookie jar. And I think you've mm-hmm. got a lot of voices that are telling you to do certain things and you kind of have to just do it because you're bound, right? Contractually. Yeah. So, and now the landscape is so different. Like now, I mean, TikTok is introducing billboard charts, like because- yeah they're so powerful in driving sales, you know, for music or, you know, artist awareness. So it's just crazy, you know, how much it's, how much, how much it's like shifted. Yeah. I mean, and the TikTok stuff is like, it's a bit annoying because (laughs) it's like you, for these amazing artists, like even, you know, massive artists, I know Marin Morris has spoken about it. I know Camila Cabello has, has spoken out about it. It's like, they're like, if the labels are like, well, if you don't end up charting on TikTok, TikTok then we're not going to invest. Yeah. We're not going to invest in the project anymore. And we're going to kill it. Yeah. And it's like, but it's good. And there are still other ways that people consume music that I think right. we're forgetting about. But True. Um, speaking of albums, yes. I know I did remember that Christina had signed with 19 management, yeah. but did we ever get a Christina album? Cause I don't we, think I ever heard one. We did. And she still won't send me those tracks. I'm like, I want to hear <laughs> them. I literally want to hear them. I mean, cause Same. she sent me this like shoot that she was doing. I can't remember where she shot it, but it was like in this desert and she looked like unreal. I was yeah. like, oh, okay, what's going on? Um, but I remember that. I mean, she, I mean, she's one of the most beautiful human beings ever. Um, I just saw her uh, in, in June because we took her son to, um, uh, like a college sort of uh, summer thing at University of Chicago. And so, I mean, her amazing. kids are gorgeous. Like, she's just amazing, like the best ever. Um, but yeah, I mean, and and point to be made is that we all had, I think the first five more so than me, because I was ninth. But when you, even when you have that much exposure, it's still not easy to get a record deal. I worked for years. Like I worked for, I, I moved to LA so the show was in 2002. I got my album. Was in so it took me three years to like get a deal. And I didn't even have that exposure. And I was gay on top of it. So, mm-hmm. you know, back then, you know, you, I worked really, really hard. I, I met with labels and I met with agents and managers. And they were like, we don't know what to do with you. Like, we're just like, there was no act to follow. There was like, just do prides. And I was like, yeah. okay, you know, which was fine. You know, and I had a, a top 20 you know, billboard, you know, dance hit on the charts, which I was, you know, super grateful for. But after that, it was sort of like, okay, you know, there wasn't like placement, you know, in TV or film, like there was none of that. Again, social media was was just kind of starting, I think at that point. Um, but again, different landscape, different time. Yeah. But I did the best with what I, what I could do at, at the time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and now here we are, here we are 12 years after you released your last music. Yeah. Why? What inspired it? Uh, and I mean, I think maybe the first question is why so long? Yeah. And then what inspired you to come back? Um, why so long? A um, couple of reasons. One is, is that I think it was a timing thing. Um, it's also a financial thing. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not cheap to do this and to do this right. And for me, Chris, like, I don't half-ass anything. Like if I'm going to, if I'm going to come back, I'm going to do the shoot. I'm going to do the remixes. I'm going to do the single. I'm going to promote, like, I'm I'm not, I just don't, I'm all in, you know? So part of that, but then also I think it's, I've been so like hearing you like say like how I've inspired other people and it feels really good, but I, it's almost full circle for me because I'm very inspired by Kim Petras and, um, you know, Todrick Hall, you know, who's killing it in being mm-hmm. independent art, you know, independently, you know, funded and, you know, doing all of his, his projects and other idols, you know, Adam Lambert and then Sam Smith and Haley Kiyoko and all of these incredible mainstream queer and, and trans artists. It made me feel safe, you know, at 40 now, I feel like maybe there's room, like maybe now is a good time to, you know, put some music out. And, and I think too, I was like, well, do I do something that's political because it's such a shit show right now with, you know, just the anti, like everything in our community, or do I do something that's just kind of fun? And because we know that shit lives Mm -hmm. there, we just can't like focus on it. Right. Right. So 
if all we can do is focus on the things that make us happy and bring us joy, I then sort of, you know, shifted and I said, all right, well, let's just do something that's kind of fun, you know, because there's a time and a place to make an anthem for, you know, the, the political, you know, time that we're in. Yeah. And it's been so long. And so I think I got in my head, like, what do people want and what do they expect? And I don't want to disappoint them and blah, blah, blah. So I, um, I met this producer who I'd known through a mutual friend years ago. Um, his name is Lave. Um, he produced uh, music for Mac Miller and uh, Chance the Rapper. And he's very talented, had a, had a darker kind of urban tone to his production, which I really loved. And I sort of told him like, hey, I'm looking to get back into it. I'm very serious about it. So let me know your time frame, how much you're going to cost, you know, what you want from me. Um, he's like, great. Tell me who you're inspired by right now. You know, and I said, Tove Lo. Um, I said, hmm. um, Troy Sivan. I said, Dua Lipa. You know, I said, I definitely want to do something that's a little bit darker, that hits a little harder. And he was like, cool. I'm, I'm all about it. Sent me over three rough kind of tracks. I picked one and he sort of fleshed it out. And then I met a songwriter named Jace Green, he's out of Oklahoma City, this very young, like 23-year-old queer songwriter. And I'm like, he's like telling me, like, do you know TikTok? You need to. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's not make me feel totally old. Um, but he's like, no, you need to do like a sped up version. Then you need to do like an instrumental version. Then you need like a vocal version. And I was like, well, I never would have known that mm-hmm. had he not, you know, shared this with me. And he's just so talented. And I remember we would we would go through these um, these songwriting sessions on FaceTime. And Jace, as young as he is, is also so, so smart. He would take notes and he would literally like write down words that I repeated constantly. And he would be like, show me this like big piece of paper. And he'd say, did you know that you said the word control 14 times in this conversation? And I was like, huh, okay. Um, So I I knew right away that he was just the right, the right person to work with. And so we came up with Take My Bow and Take My Bow is, it's got a lot of double entendres, you know, through it. I think one of them is you know, not being ready for you then, but I'm ready for you now. And I think that's very all encompassing of the time, the climate. Um, I think where I'm in, where I'm at in life, um, just age maturity. And I think just feeling very confident in in where things are at. And then just, you know, little things like, you know, everyone has their sexual proclivities and attractions and fantasies and, you know, and I think that's lyrically just me being like, tell me what you want and I will give it to you. And that's Mm -hmm. sort of the, the lyric meaning behind the song. So I just wanted something fun. I've got three remixes planned. Um, the, the sort of goal is to get this to chart in the UK first. Mm -hmm. So I've got three remixes, um, uh, from all, uh, like three UK London based DJs and they're awesome. And then Tommy Sunshine, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Tommy, but he's done remixes for, you know, Kim Petras, Nicki Minaj, um, Harry Styles and um, Katy Perry. So he's doing my US remix. So amazing. Um, I'm excited. Is there like, you know, an album on the way? I don't know. I'm not going to say no. It's more like, let me dip my toe in and see where things are at. I think if anything, I would want to do a video probably to this and see okay. where that goes. It's really expensive to do independently, oh, yeah. even with connections and hookups and, you know, um, shooting it on something very, very, you know, doing a very minimal video, it's still expensive. And, but the beauty behind doing it independently is you own it, it's yours. And so rather than be tied to a label and, you know, 500 grand, you know, in the can, and that's if they even think your project is worthy of, of investing in, it's like, I'd rather just own it outright, you know, and, and have complete control. So, yeah. And I think, um, and there's the word control again. I know. Um, God, so <laughs> the, uh, the interesting thing too, and I, it, I wonder, I, I mean, I'm, I probably know that this is the case, but a lot of the people that have come off of idol that have had like kind of a one album and done sort of situation is a lot of like what you just kind of described is they didn't own it. They didn't control it. They, you know, did it because they got this, deal coming off of the show but then it what didn't really set them up to sort of figure out what was next beyond that and i think that's probably why you know we don't see you know some of the folks that we named that we didn't get long careers out of even though there was the talent there it was like that was there and they didn't have probably the right tools at the time and and certainly not now and but now is 
I mean, as much as I just said, I sort of can't stay on TikTok. It does give people more freedom. It yeah. gives there's social media, YouTube, all of the, the platforms that you can kind of control. I mean, even me doing this and being able to, I've had several, you know, folks reach out about like join our podcast network and you know, we'll help you grow it and advertising and all that stuff. And I'm like, I'm not interested. I'm doing this for me. one, And two, like at the, at the end of the day, I want to own everything that I do. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that. And now you can, because you can click a button and release a song or, you know, release an episode or whatever it is through the click of a button. And it's so much easier to do now than, you know, back in the day when you first were getting started. I almost wish that idol had like a built in, let us help you after you leave the show because I mean, I, it would have been nice to have have some management guidance or at least, Mm -hmm. Hey, if you make the top 10, we're going to sign you so that we help you develop artistry, you know, meet producers, work with a couple of songs. It wouldn't necessarily promise you a deal, but I think if you had that support, just so at least they took care of you for like that, because you're, you're thrust into the spotlight and, you know, you're, you're, everything in your mind is telling you, you need to be successful. And like when you're so young and you're trying to thrive and, and pay your bills and live in LA, you know, we didn't make like a fraction of the money that, you know, people bought houses that were on idle. Like we didn't have anywhere near that. So yeah. I just, I wish there would have been almost like an incubator, you know, group of like, if you make the top 10, we're going to sign you for a year. We're going to do this artist development. You know, we're going to have you work on a demo because then at least you would have felt a little more confident and right. you would have, you know, I mean, with the connections between, you know, Randy and Paula and the people that they knew. And I just feel like that would have been a really nice thing because nobody knows how to do this, man. Even not even the first season, I was like, I'm from Crystal Lake, Illinois, and I'm on the cover of TV Guide at 19. And now it's yeah. like, how do I make an album? Who do I talk to? Who do I trust? Yeah. Who is my network? Who do I let in my life? You know what I mean? It's just, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think like Ryan Starr is probably one of those people too, who she was like the face of that first se- season in the yeah. beginning. Because and she's hot as hell, you know, hot as hell. Yeah. And, you know, but also sort of thrust into this like spotlight in a very big way. And like you just said, like you go from essentially, I mean, even Kelly Clarkson talks about like, you know, even though she was recording demos and wanted to be a singer, she, you know, her apartment burned down and she yeah. goes from that to all of us who no one knows she was on interviewed on the news to now she's America's idol. And totally. you, this show was in that first season, it became it like skyrocketed and it was the way that, and the reason I, you know, even said at the beginning, like an OG pop culture icon, because you think about like shows like Saved by the Bell or 90210 or things yeah. like that. And you hear about how like all of a sudden it, it took off. Right. And then it was like, these people are uber famous yeah. and overnight. And that was like really you guys in that moment, like of the top 10, it was like this overnight fame. You guys were on the tours. It was like a machine. Suddenly everyone realized what they had. And then the success only kind of grew from there of the show became more popular. And then you've got people like you just said that have to potentially go back to their lives. And what is that like? And, you know, I I mean, at the time, you know, now with streaming and all this stuff, it seems like, why didn't they have a, a pickup show where they followed the lives of the, you know, the top 10 post idol and like made it more of a reality show while the, you know, second season was, was running and like continued to tell those stories or something because it was like all of a sudden some of you after the tour, it was like, where did these folks go? Like I just said, where, what happened to Christina? I mean, I was on the message boards, like yeah. where following everyone. I had my like, I yeah. was like waiting for all, I was going to buy all the albums. I have, you know, RJs, I have all, all the albums that came out in one CD booklet and I like would keep them in order of how you guys got voted off. And then, uh, and I would like keep some open, like I would keep the spot open for Christina and like Ryan and all of the stuff. And like, but then you never got it. And I feel like it's because it's like they had to go back to the real world. Or even like mentors, like they could have brought us back and we could have mentored, you know, kind of like the voice obviously does, but I think to actually have a contestant that had made it to top 10, because you can't re-audition if you make it to top 10, like that's contractually obligated. So I never would have done it anyway, but you know, I think if you make top 30, I think you can, you can come back. But Mm -hmm. um, I would have loved to have come back, especially if there were like queer youth who were like thinking about coming out for idol, like, hi, I would have been like the perfect person to be like, 
hey, you're don't be afraid. You got this. Like, you know, you will have a career, I promise you. And I just think when it comes from a fellow contestant, it just means more. Like I've been there. I've gone through yeah. this. Like I know what it's like. Let me kind of help you. And I wish that they would have done that for us. I mean, now on Idol, they have like on-site therapists. I mean, they have like yeah. coaches for every round and like vocal. We didn't have any of that. We didn't even have a live band until Kelly did like big band <laughs> night, I think. And she was like, that was like the final five, you know, we, was, right. we were to track for like most of you know, the final 10. So, you know, I well, just, and your think, catalog was much smaller too. Well, that's too. I had like nine songs and they're like, <laughs> memorize this and then perform it for millions of people. Great. Thanks. Okay. And I was like, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. People don't realize that like, you know, the more expensive a song is to clear on national television because they're new or they're a top 40, you know, hit, we can't afford to play that and air it on mm-hmm. national television. So what do we have? Well, we have songs from like the sixties and the seventies and, you know, you're limited. So of course I would have picked a better song if I could. Um, but we were, you know, it was like a page and here's like, that's all you get, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I remember like the, those first few seasons, the theme weeks were always like just sort of like random genres, and, like really old songs. Yes, and yeah. then like, you could tell when the show shifted and it was like, we're going to do Celine Dion week. Totally. And it was like, yeah. okay, well now we've, yeah, we've reached. Money. Yeah, yeah, we've reached the exactly. pinnacle. Yeah. Um, well, awesome. Well, so we don't know you, but you did mention there's three songs, but right now it's just the one. It's just the one. Um, okay. But again, I we will see what happens. I, I don't want to say no, but again, it's. I think this is I, just like you do this podcast and you do this, you know, Chris, very very well. I I've missed it. I've missed you know um, creating, and I think. I've always loved the process. I've always loved like, you know, being in the studio or writing or collaborating with a songwriter. I love that. You're making something from nothing. You have literally nothing. And then you have a song and people are listening to it and they, you know, want to learn the words or they want to harmonize to it. And then you can, you know, kind of manipulate it into a remix and then you breathe new life into it. And so that whole process, you know, me thinking through the image of what I wanted to do and, you know, the look for the photo shoot and, remixes and sounds and all of that. I love that whole journey. Yeah. It's just fun. It's really fun for me. And so it's nice because there's no pressure. I, I'm a tech recruiter, you know, for a great company. I love my job. Um, and so this isn't, you know, I don't think I'm going to, you know, full fledge this out, you know, and, you know, full time it. I just think it's more like I would regret it if I didn't do this now yeah. and, and just sort of see, you know, hey, what's, what's what could happen? You know, and may, and maybe you will be full timing it at some at some juncture. From your lips to God's ears, Chris. Here's yes. Here's I, hoping. I, I hope she's a listener. <laughs> <laughs> um. So okay. Well, awesome. Maybe a video coming. Maybe. And um, you mentioned like the artwork. So if folks haven't seen it. They need to follow you because very sexy imagery. You're putting you're putting it almost all out oh, there. I mean, I'm pretty much. I mean, it might as well be at this point. But you know what? <laughs> like, who cares? It's like. It's because it's just a butt. I mean, don't freak out. Like, it's just a butt. It's not, you know, it's nothing crazy. I just feel like we, I don't know. I, I just think people in the in our country tend to, like, be a little bit more, like, meek about sexuality and, and body. And I think we just need to love ourselves a hell of a lot more than we do. And, you know, Amen. I'm 40. I don't want it. I, mean, I might as well take it now before I, you know, turn to shit. So... <laughs> No, it's, it's awesome. But so do tell us where we can follow you so that we yes. can continue to follow the journey. Yeah. So I'm super active on Instagram. My handle is just my name. So at Jim Verraros, V-E-R-R-A-R-O-S. Take My Bow is officially out on all platforms. So please stream, please support queer art and queer artistry. Um, so appreciate, you know, everyone's support thus far, but um, stay tuned. We've got some fun things ahead. Awesome. And maybe, maybe TikTok at some point. Yes. Maybe TikTok at some point. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Well, Jim, thank you for doing this. Thank it you. was so fun to catch up with you. I feel like I could just like, I feel like you're like a friend and I feel like yes. we could just like chat about everything, you know, I know. About this for hours. So we need like mimosas and brunch like oh, next God. time in Let's front of us show and just film that. Yes. <laughs> That's your next, next, your next edition is like idols, like X, like what happens after <laughs> dark or something. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Um, I'll just host it on OnlyFans. Yes, that's perfect. Let's make some money. 
<laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much. You. And uh, for all of you out there, definitely go and stream or download and buy Jim's new single. Um, it's amazing. Like I said, it's sexy, it's hot and it's a bop. So you got to go check it out. Um, and then also don't forget to rate and subscribe so that you never miss an episode of the gist. Uh, we'll be back next week. I'm on, I'm at CM Vitrano on Instagram threads, Twitter, and TikTok. And, um, yeah, until next time, thanks so much for listening. Bye.